Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we are delighted to talk about our last panel, um, how should we be addressing IoT security? Um, in this round, we're really excited because we reached out to several people in the marketplace and kind of got a diverse set of backgrounds here. Um, and it's important we have a diverse set of backgrounds here because this is a very complex subject. And so with that being said, I'm actually going to hand it over to Paul Roberts. Paul is the founder and editor-in-chief at the Security Ledger and the Security of Things Forum. And he's actually going to go ahead and moderate this panel for us. So with that, no further ado, Paul, please take over. And thanks again for moderating. <laughs> My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for her, uh, for asking me. This is a... Uh... This is an honor and uh, and a treat. Um, so yeah, and thanks to everybody out there online who's joining us for this Internet of Things Day event, which is uh, you know IoT Live and uh, the panel that we're going to do, which is actually focused on Internet of Things security. Uh, that's a really big topic, and we've actually got. Um, folks here who really, I think, represent the breadth of that very big topic. So I think you're in for a treat. It's going to be a good discussion. And we're going to talk about kind of uh, security in all of its different uh, forms as it relates to the Internet of Things, both how to secure Internet of Things environments, how Internet of Things can, you know, be used to uh, enhance either individual or organizational security. Um, as well as um, you know some of the challenges that go along with you know uh, you know uh, the, or security and privacy challenges that go along with this new kind of model for computing this new environment that we're all uh, inhabiting um, and so that's um, that's what we're going to be talking about. Let me just take a minute to introduce our panelists and then I'm going to I'm going to let each of them. Uh, say hi and also tell you a little bit about the company uh, that they are from and and what their superpower is uh, as it was uh, <laughs> so speaking of superpowers I'm going to introduce uh, Chris Ruland who is the CEO of Bastille Networks and a very very uh, well-known and well-respected authority on uh, information security going back a, a long time Chris welcome and I'm thrilled to have you here on the panel yeah thank you so much for having me and good to talk to you again our superpower is x-ray vision into the IOT. <laughs> and um, the, the thesis of what we're doing, this is something uh, I kind of came up with, put the Lego pieces on the table in my garage. Our one year birthday is tomorrow. And um, the thesis is that uh, the IOT is composed of billions and billions of devices and over a hundred different wireless protocols. Um, and today, enterprises have no visibility into what is bouncing around or operating in their airspace. And as you know, the first tenet of information security is to know what you have. You can't secure what you don't know is there. So we're providing situational awareness to the enterprise on the IoT and its associated emitters uh, that are in that space. And, and, and we're, we're getting just fantastic reception. And it's, it's definitely a brand new space and, and, and new idea. Do you want to talk a little bit about your background as well, some of the things you did before Bastille? Yeah, sure. I mean, I've only, it's pretty simple. I've only worked a couple places. I started my career in New York City at, at uh, Lehman Brothers, and I was recruited. Never heard of them. Never heard of them. <laughs> I was recruited by Tom Noonan and Chris Klaus to build their research team at Internet Security Systems called the X-Force, and was had the opportunity to really kind of help define the responsible disclosure process that has just radically matured today. It's amazing. Um, and so I was very fortunate to be part of that. And I took over as chief technology officer there. And uh, we sold that company and then subsequently founded a cybersecurity company called Endgame, um, which um, was more focused on the defense sector and ran that and um, took some time off and came up with this idea. And uh, uh, we're rocking and rolling and, and um, uh, having a lot of fun. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. Okay, Charles uh, Wheeler, you are the um, Senior Developer of Operations at uh, Brevi uh, Brevo. Tell us a little bit about Brevo. Sure. Uh, so Brevo is the uh, largest access control provider in the cloud, um, and that, that's sort of our superpowers. We're bringing uh, cloud architecture and cloud computing to the physical access control space and allowing people to control the security of their buildings contextually. So your lobby or your innovation spaces or, or public areas don't necessarily have to have 
the same level of control as you know the private offices, and you can increase or decrease uh, the level of access uh, to various people based on the, the situational needs. Um, we've been doing this about 15 years. Uh, my background prior to Brevo uh, was I spent a few years as uh, IT operations Beltway Bandit, uh, working for various government agencies and contractors. Um, in the last five years were at the White House Data Center, uh, and uh, then I got uh, hired on uh, at Brevo uh, to do their IT security and data privacy work. Uh, so it's a, a great pleasure to be here, and uh, definitely heard of uh, Endgame, so uh, that was a like a nice uh, connection. Blast from the past. Though. Thanks, guys. Right. right. Uh, and Brevo's been around for quite a few years. I mean, you you were We've talking been around about, about yeah, which is a yeah. Uh, Brevo's been around about fifteen years. We got started in nineteen ninety nine, um, and our our first real you know commercial success uh, was in mm -hmm. two thousand two with a building access control panel. And um, you know, to us, it seemed like a pretty simple innovation, but the idea that you can take the data for your building card holders, for your uh, for your doors and cameras and, and you know access points, and store that off-site uh, in a way that is more secure, more reliable, and faster than you know building your own stack. Right, right. Um, okay, do we, uh, I, I, uh, I don't think we have Don with us uh, from uh, Revelar, yeah, or Revelar yet, but uh, hopefully he'll be joining us shortly. So um, it's going to be the three of us. Um, why don't we start off, um, which in some ways both of you guys are very, uh, both of your companies are enterprise focused, albeit in, in different ways. Um, why don't we start off by talking about uh, this Internet of Things space, I see a really big um, uh, kind of split between what a lot of people think of when they think of Internet of Things, which is kind of the consumer space, and, um, you know, Charles, maybe you're a good person to talk about this, what many organizations have been doing for a long time, which is connecting and starting to instrument aspects of their physical environment, whether those are manufacturing and, and mining and energy companies or just, you know, enterprises with, you know, environmental controls and things like that. So, um, you know, Brevo's been around since 1999 under different names. Is this really, are we, is there anything really new going on here as you see it? Sort of. So I think what is uh, what's really new in the space is the amount of data that you can gather, uh, and the number of sensors that are available. the The real innovation is the fact that we can we can now measure things and control things in a way that we couldn't before, um, using technology that in previous years might have been considered consumer tech. But as you mentioned, for you know for a long time there have been. Uh, industries that have been trying to get to gather this data and developing sensors and systems within the industry within that individual company, um, such as within a manufacturing plant or uh, trucking and transportation right. logistics is one where any data point that you can gather helps you to run your business more efficiently. You know where are your trucks? How fast are they going? Uh, you know how much fuel are they using per mile if they follow a particular route versus another route? And what we're start starting to see trickle down from a very large enterprise level to sort of the small and medium business is is the desire to have that data and improve uh, the efficiency of your operation using sensors that are now much more affordable uh, and open source or off-the-shelf software to help you make sense of all that information. Um, I think the the big innovation in the next couple of years is going to be in the hardware much like it was uh, maybe 10 years ago with mobile but shortly after that, we're going to see another jump uh, in the ability of software to help us make sense of that information. And that, um, I think, that's where the the security of the security products and the security models that we adopt for the IoT devices is really going to make a, a big difference. Okay. And when you say the advancements are going to be in the hardware, what do you mean by that? What What are you referring to specifically? Sure. So right now, I think we're at a very sort of green field. Um, we're not really sure what we're trying to measure, um, and there's not a lot of, uh, there's just a lot of space in which people can operate. And so folks are in garages, they're in small startups, they're in 
uh, you know, they're in their own labs going out and they're creating new sensors to measure things that we couldn't previously measure, or we're using existing equipment in new ways. Um, for example, one of the things that Brevo's working on right now is the ability to use mobile phones or wearable devices as an access control, control credential. Instead right. of carrying your ID card with you, why not use a Fitbit right. or use your mobile device? Uh, right. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about hardware. Okay. Uh, Chris, what you um, you obviously were involved with um, ISS and and it was kind of an early player in um, in the IT security space um, uh, around threats, threat detection, um, and so on. Um, what do you see as um, the, the impediments or the uh, the, the um, irritants of that that the Internet of Things is going to create for enterprise, you know, for rank and file enterprise customers. Um, you know, again, if the threat so, ten years ago, so, uh, yeah, so, so, uh, email-based malware uh, and um, uh, you know denial of service attacks or uh, the, or brute force attacks. What is how does the Internet of Things going to change the uh, conversation within the enterprise around the security? Ben Surf just did an event here at Georgia Tech, and that made a very provocative comment. He said, uh, "I'm not worried about hackers. I'm worried about a million Samsung refrigerators DDoSing Bank of America." And uh, I thought that was that was that was that was a, a a strong comment. Although I personally don't agree with it that there's a risk if the refrigerators are going to shut down B of A. Um, the um, you know, in IoT security, we're very early stages, and it means there's opportunity for innovation on the security side. Um, and we're seeing a lot of errors. The quality of code we're seeing on these embedded devices is 1980s, 1990s grade, right? FTC Ramirez is going after these companies that are making stupid mistakes, like leaving shared keys in Snapchat. <laughs> it's unbelievable. That these errors are being made, and if, if if so, I use the number 50 billion devices by 2020. So let's say they're about 1,690 days till 2020. That means that 15 million IoT devices have to be deployed per day, right? And there's no way to do that securely, right? Uh, we have not seen a watershed event. I think so. One big water, certainly the Robert Morris Forum was a big watershed event in 1988. The, the big watershed event we saw in, in corporate security for antivirus on mail servers was Melissa. Right? It didn't really do any damage. It just shut everything down. And the next day, it became mandatory. I think we'll begin to see wearables become mandatory or opt-in uh, because of the, the great insurance breaks companies will get. Then we're going to have a very interesting data privacy challenge. Okay, now my employer knows a lot of personal information about me that they did not have before. What happens when that is compromised? Additionally, while the MDM space has done a good job on devices that, that, that their, their employees will allow them to install software on, but of the 50 billion devices we're talking about in 2020, maybe a third of them can run an agent. So you're talking about two-thirds of them being very small embedded devices. And my last point on this, if there are 50 billion devices out there active, my Fitbit is on software version number 64. How many patches per year? It's in the trillions. So the big fix guy has got to do another startup to, to create, create a patch business for all these b billions of devices. That's not the problem we're trying to solve. I hate patches. So what? Tell me just a little bit. So Bastille's customers um, are the are the organizations who are thinking now about securing IoT. Um, the companies you would think of, so companies in retail or manufacturing or heavy industry that have huge um, install base of connected equipment, or are they? Um, you know, financial services and and uh, some and and banking, where they're kind of looking more down the road, uh, or healthcare, for example. But, well, typically, FinServe is the early adopter in new in new security technology, and they're good to work with because they'll, they'll work with a, a startup like us and help us grow our technology. Um, and um, and they are concerned about what is in their airspace, what 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 is coming in and out of their building. Right. You know, it, it did a 4G hotspot open 40 megahertz of bandwidth at 2 in the morning in the data center. 
Right. That's a bad thing, right? That's a data connection. This is a very simple example. Um, I think retail will be an interesting sector. It's not one we're pursuing yet, uh, but clearly after last year with, it, with five companies in the $100 million club, um, we're going to see an increased spend in retail. Um, but um, so, you know, at the end of the day, though, Paul, there is no line item budget for IRT security. And so that's what we're trying to create awareness for for next year to right. create an IoT budget line for security. How much of an overlap is this, though, with the wireless security issues that companies have been dealing with for a while? That's a great question. Well, my position is that the IoT is not Wi-Fi. Most companies have done a good job with Wi-Fi, but most IoT devices don't need the bandwidth or power of, of, of 802.11n or AC, so they're using VTLE, they'll use Thread, they're using custom... ISM protocols, when we read documents like this is a custom protocol or we feel it's complex enough it won't be reverse engineered, that's a red flag to me saying it's vulnerable. And so, and so um, I think that the industry over the next several years will settle on Thread, which is an open source version of 6 low Okay. okay. Um, but it will still be um, Ofcom, which is the UK FCC, is allocating an entirely different frequency set than the FCC. Right. But we're not trying to solve a Wi-Fi security problem. We're trying to solve what's in the entire electromagnetic spectrum in your office. Right. Why is that a problem that uh, in one country you would have uh, one bit of the spectrum allocated for IoT and in a different country uh, a different part of the spectrum? It depends on your approach. So our technology, and I don't, I'm not gonna, I don't want to pimp ourselves, but our, our technology basically scans the, the, the full spectrum and so that means we can operate in different countries. We don't care what bands are allocated. But if you if you take an ASIC and you you say, okay, we're gonna this is gonna support the uh, U.S. Uh, frequency sets, and it's not gonna you're gonna have to make a new one for Europe. Right. Ours we just push a software update. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, and I should remind the audience, we've got a bunch of people who are watching this, that we are taking questions. We're going to leave some time at the end of our um, discussion to respond to your questions. We've already had a couple people ask them. If you go to the left-hand side of your uh, Hangout window and click that QA uh, button, uh, you'll be able to pose a question. And uh, I promise, uh, if it's within the bounds of politeness, that I will uh, ask that question of our guests. <laughs> Chris might even take an impolite question. I don't even know. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so use the Q and A feature. We're going to get to questions later in the session. Um, so, Charles, talk to me. Um, you talked about um, uh, the fact that um, Brevo is using uh, is really looking at authentication as a killer app for both mobile and and then down the road, presumably wearable and maybe even, you know, implantable devices, a lot of the things we're talking about with Internet of Things. Um, is, is that sort of low-hanging fruit for organizations? So now we're talking about Internet of Things in the, con in the context of improving or enhancing security, making sure that, you know, uh, this employee really is Paul Roberts and not somebody else. Um, is that low-hanging fruit for, for enterprises in your mind? I, I think it is. You know, one of the one of the bugaboos in physical security that we've been dealing with for years is the low adoption rate for biometrics. Um, right. You know, very very strong credential factors, but really nobody wants to use them. And traditionally, biometric readers were slow. They were expensive. You know, nobody wants to put their eyeball up to a reader that everybody else in the company has put their eye on. Right. All these traditional problems, but. One of the things that's really come out of the IoT, and especially the wearable space, is we're gathering biometrics passively all the time. If you've got a Jawbone or a Fitbit, we're picking up your heart rate, which is a fairly hard to duplicate signature of an individual, um, just all the time. So if you can tie that in to your access control system, and you have you know, the right intelligence around it to account for things like if you come back to the office after taking a run versus you know, uh, being a little bit more relaxed, um, it allows us to start using biometric data in a way that we've been trying to do for years that is very, very convenient and it's very, very easy on the end user. If we put the intelligence in the device and make the users a little bit more passive, I think we can improve the overall security, at least in the physical space. 
I hear you on that. Um, it, it does get into the uh, to the issue, though, of um, and I think in some ways we we saw this with um, uh, you know one time passwords and so on, right? So what then becomes uh, the device? Is it Fitbit or is it Apple Watch or is it um, you know Jawbone, right? So you have this um, wealth of information uh, that's being collected by these devices. Um, but don't enterprises want to standardize, right, in the same way that they really wanted to standardize on mobile phones, even though they never worked, were able to? <laughs> yeah, and I think that that's an apt analogy. I think they're going to want to standardize, but at least for the next couple of years, we're not going to get an actual standard, right? Um, you know, this we're, we're going to see some folks that use the Apple Watch. Some folks are going to, you know, solely deal with, like, near-field communications, and some other folks might pick Bluetooth Low Energy. Um there's going to be a couple of competing standards out there for at least a few years. And I think, um, you know, Chris's point about the, you know, 50 billion devices by 2020 just sort of makes that an open question for quite a while to come. Um, you know, as long as the hardware manufacturers are out there creating new devices, new technology, new sensors, it's in their best interest not to rush to a standard too quickly and to see you know, as safely as possible, certainly, but, you know, to see what, what really is the best option for each enterprise. Um, to, you know, Chris brought up the, um, some of the confusion around, for example, spectrum allocation. Um, he mentioned a thread standard. There's been a kind of open conversation about standards around Internet of Things. In other words, wouldn't it be great if all these devices, you know, it didn't matter, right, what, what, fitness watch or fitness band you were wearing because they all were basically speaking the same protocol and, and, and designed to the same standards. Um, is that an issue for a company like uh, Brio? I mean, do you guys, have you thrown your weight behind any of the uh, nascent standards, All Seen or Thread or um, uh, I, what is it, IIC or Internet? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you see that being yeah. any as, as actually gaining uh, adoption? You know, honestly, I think right now it's it's a little too soon to tell. We haven't thrown our way behind a particular standard, um, you know, because we work with channel partners and we work with a variety of uh, hardware manufacturers. Um, you know, we try to, to kind of, you know, keep an open mind, but, you know, Bluetooth Low Energy certainly has uh, some applications as a you know, certainly a, a standard transmission platform. Thread is very promising, but yeah, we haven't we haven't really picked a horse yet, and I don't think we're going to certainly in the next year. Um, have to see how things shake out a little bit more first. And Chris, what do you think? I mean, you've seen a replay of this in the uh, you know IT security space, right? The traditional IT security space around. You know, silos and product families and, you know, single pane of glass. Um, uh, as a security technology vendor, do you want or even need some overarching uh, IoT standard to write to? Uh, no, because, you know, think of, think of us as vulnerability assessment and intrusion detection for the IoT. And um, that, that's the company I'm building. Um, and to date myself, so I know how to install a Banyan Vines network. I can install a Novell IPX network. I can install an NIS network and an NFS network. That's what the IoT looks like today. Try getting a Novell server to talk to a Sun server. Right. It's literally like 1989, right. um, and it's a mess. Right, right. Um, <laughs> and, I mean, do you think, uh, is it going to be the same evolutionary process that we saw with, you know, traditional uh, uh, IP-based networking where... I mean, who knows? You know, if Novell had won, we could all be running IPX today. <laughs> but, but, but TCP IP won. And, and, um, and it's, I'm, I'm glad it did. Uh, and so, um, but you've also got devices that have been in data centers for 10 years that are still beaconing out Zigbee. You know, who's going to go upgrade those? Uh, right. So you've got, you've got industrial control protocols that are part of the IoT, like it or not. They aren't getting upgraded anytime soon. I mean, these guys have 10, 20 year duty cycles, right. and they are vulnerable. Right. Um, what do you? Um, one of the things that strikes me is that that we're used to when we talk about security. 
uh, in the context of, of traditional IT security um, that, you know, we talk about servers and laptops and desktops um, as being the types of devices that might be affected by security issues that might be hacked into or, or you know, knocked offline. Um, it seems to me, or it strikes me, that in the Internet of Things context, those conversations become a lot more um, personal and important. So for, you know, Chris, you mentioned the spamming refrigerator. Um, you know, the consequences of your, of your refrigerator getting bricked for you as an individual are actually a lot higher than for your laptop, right? Because your refrigerator has perishable food inside of it. You need to eat. Uh, I mean, these are all kind of, you know, it, it needs to be fixed immediately, whereas with your laptop, you know, if you're getting blue screened, you can kind of close the lid and stick it away in the corner, maybe, and deal with it later. Yeah, I mean, imagine if someone bricked a million refrigerators on Christmas Eve, it would, uh, it would ruin some Christmases. Uh, uh, and so, um, no, I mean, I, th I think uh, the one that comes to mind most recently is the uh, Samsung gate, where uh, the Samsung license agreement, when you opt into the new smart TV, uh, you're agreeing to record your conversations and transmit them to the cloud. Right. Um, I mean, I think we crossed the line there, and, right. um, and, and, and we'll start to get some pushback. And I, I personally have a thesis, and a lot of this has to do with millennials and millennials in the workplace. And we found, we can post a reference to the survey in the chat, but I found a survey by a third party that over 60% of millennials are aware of their corporate security policy and willfully ignore it. So, so now you got millennials with a lot of devices who just don't care that there's a corporate security policy. Right. Um, and now you've got multiple, multiple hops that Malco can jump across, but we might not see a watershed event for two years. Right. And so, um, conversely, I see a new IoT device get hacked or owned every day. If you look at the hacker conferences, I mean, it's such low hanging fruit. These guys don't know how to secure stuff. Right, right. You know, Chris, I remember, like, you know, with, with again, with sort of traditional enterprise IT, it was, you know, there was a, that awareness kind of came on the tail of big incidents. So, I mean, you mentioned Melissa, that was one around. Um, you know, email-based, you know, viruses. And then, you know, SQL Slammer was another one, you know, where people realized, oh, my God, you know, we've got all these SQL servers that are exposed. We've got SQL embedded in some of our desktops. That, we that, that thing is still bouncing around 12 years later. Right. It's spread all over the world in, like, 30 minutes. Um, so, I mean, to the extent that we're on the cusp of this Internet of Things, I mean, what do you, what do you think? What's going to be the SQL slammer for the Internet of Things? What is the problem that people are going to have their attention riveted on kind of by necessity? Um, well, I mean, we're, we're in a different world today. So, you know, in the 90s and early 2000s, those references you meant, you, you referenced, they were not for profit, right? They were malicious, but they were they no one made money. And I think the trend today is for malicious code to generate a profit. You look at, at BitLocker. So um, so you're let's say ten years from now you're driving your Tesla and uh, God forbid you don't have a pacemaker, you get a pacemaker, you get a little jolt and a text message on your screen saying, Why are you fifty thousand bitcoins or I'm disabling your brakes and turning off your pacemaker. Um, you're probably going to pay. And so I do think we'll see ransomware um, around the IoT in the future because it's just it's the current trend. Right, right. And, and those guys can make money faster than the good guys can. Right, right. Well, and to my point, you know, um, uh, you, you have control over things that are intimately part of people's lives. You know, their stove or their refrigerator, that, that's actually a lot a lot more um, intimate and valuable to them necessarily uh, maybe than their than their laptop. Um, Charles, what um, you know as as Brevo kind of um, looks at this space that's evolving, let's say it's the sort of IoT in the context of the enterprise, um, uh, in its in the context of enterprise security, what are some of the opportunities that you guys see for um, leveraging, as you said, some of these, you know, inexpensive sensors, um, you know, uh, commercial off-the-shelf software and hardware, um, and how do you deal with the issue that Chris brought up, which is 
Sure, it's easy to cobble these devices together and make something new that's cool. It's harder to do it in a way that really holds up to the standards of, you know, craftsmanship and security and code quality that, you know, a, a corporate customer is going to expect. I think, take it a couple different ways. Chris's point, I think, is a very good one, but in both of the sort of technology watersheds that we've seen in the last few years, both with the LAN-WAN networking in the 90s and then the mobile devices in the early 2000s. None of those technologies for the first four or five years were really up to standard with the existing technology. It's going to take a few more years of growth before the IoT companies are big enough, are mature enough to provide the code quality that we see right now right. from say Apple, right, or uh, you know, a large uh, software shop. That's an evolutionary path that we seem to, you know, restart every 10 or 12 years. Um, and I, I think we're going to follow very similar lines. The thing that we can do from the enterprise side is to pick the right partners. Well, there are a lot of sensors out there. There's a lot of new software. There's a lot of new applications for those sensors and software. We can help pick winners and losers based on which are the best quality products. But we have to look at data security as a product, as part of the offering, and not as a, a cost center or some kind of a liability. To, to kind of riff on something that Chris said a few minutes ago, the reason that I think a lot of the millennials, at least the folks that we work with, have trouble with corporate security policy is often because that corporate security policy hasn't been updated in the last seven or eight years. And so it talks about things like Blackberries and personal data assistance and you know if you're connecting through a wired you know LAN through a firewall and a traditional perimeter to the internet well no, they don't follow that policy because as far as they're concerned it's outdated and doesn't apply to them sure as we you know I think from the one of the things that we'll have to accept is the fallout of the 2014 you know the multiple corporate hacks that we saw is that Data security really starts at the top, and if you don't have good buy-in, good partners, and good a good security program from the C-suite, you're never going to really get true information defense. You, you have to treat this the same way you treat your accountants or the same way you treat your legal department. You've got to hire professionals. You've got to give it the support from all the business units or it's never really going to be effective. And the, and the implications of making, of not taking it seriously are going to be much greater uh, as IoT expands. Okay. What are some use cases that you see in your customer base um, around, um, you know, uh, of IoT and some of these issues where we're starting to move beyond conversations about what we would all recognize as kind of traditional IT environments and really starting to address uh, some of the issues that the IOT raises. Sure. One, of the, one of the first things is uh, we already have customers that are attempting to integrate IOT hardware into their access control platform. Okay. So they want to replace their traditional smart cards or access cards with mobile phones certainly, but also QR codes or, you know, the Pebble Watch or, you know, some other device to provide that access token. They want to use IoT sensors as part of the access monitoring suite. So, you know, if you're monitoring the employee break room and you have one of these smart refrigerators, they want to tie that in so that they're getting reports from the fridge on, you know, how many times it's open during the day. A lot of these folks are using this stuff in their houses already. Um, they're using it in their daily lives, and they see that it provides a tremendous level of convenience, and they want to extend that convenience into their business space. So a lot of uh, you know a lot of the early adopters, especially the the, the tech you know the, the very tech savvy C level folks, are asking, well, why can't I use my mobile phone to buzz the door? Why can't I use my tablet to access and control my surveillance video? I can do that with my drop cam for my house. What you know? Why why can't I do it for you guys? So that that's the immediate uh, growth that we found. So that kind of consumerization, Chris. 
Is that one of the issues that you see with your customers where, you know, they, they want to know kind of, um, is this happening in an ad hoc way um, and are we exposed to, you know, risk because of that? We're at a very early stage. I mean, we have pilots, right? So, so we're, we're, we're announcing the company at RSA in a couple of weeks. But uh, I'll ask you, do you remember the first time you ran Nmap? Sure. <laughs> How surprising it is to see all the stuff that's there. Yeah, sure. When, the, when the customers turn on our product, it's the same reaction. Right, well, right. What the heck is all this stuff doing here? Right. And so, so, so think of us as NMAP for the airwaves, and they find all kinds of things in their environment that they don't want there, right. should be there, and right. didn't expect to be there. So it's the first step is that, aha, I got a bunch of stuff. I got, I'll got. i tell them where it is, and they can figure out what to do with it. The next step is, okay, let's determine when it's behaving badly or violating a geofence. And the final stage is actually stopping attacks. And that's the most technically challenging with the IoT, right? I don't want to accidentally jam up someone's Bluetooth pacemaker or insulin pump. Um, and, and obviously there's significant regulations on transmitting outside the ISM bands. Uh, so intrusion prevention in the IoT is going to be a significant challenge. Um, but it, you know, I think it's I think it's an interesting and hard problem to solve. And I look forward to working on. Not to spread fear, uncertainty, and doubt, but if you could give a sense of uh, for our audience, what are some of the things that uh, might be beaconing or have a some Bluetooth built in? Um, you know, as Josh Corman says about Bluetooth, it's like bacon. You know, everything tastes better with <laughs> with bacon. What are some of the things that might be out there in their environments that have a wireless interface that they might not might not even occur to them? Uh, your mainframe has Bluetooth. Um, your chiller in your data center has Bluetooth. Your or X or Zigbee. Your UPS backup system in the commercial data center is typically has Zigbee left on by default. Any big signs saying "Do not connect to internet." Um, these are all things that could destroy a company in a matter of under an hour. Right. For example, um, you know we find um, one popular way. It's much easier to social engineer and break into a company than it is to go through the firewall, right? So there's a hacking tool called a Pwn Plug, which is basically a 3 or 4G backhaul that looks like an iPad power supply. So people cannot, our, our customers cannot find a Pwn Plug because they can't see into that spectrum. We can, and then we can localize it, and they can then remove it. So um, wireless keyboard intercept and transmitters have become interesting. You can buy these on Amazon now that will in intercept the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the keystrokes with wireless keyboard. I purchased a car recently, and I was in the finance office, and I noticed he had a wireless keyboard, and I said, how many wire transfers do you do today? He said, oh, probably 50. I said, wow, wow you're, you're just pumping all that data right, right out the air. Everyone can see it. And I recommended that he purchase a wired keyboard. So <laughs> that, that's the tip of the iceberg, um, and, and, um, and, and we're just getting started, and I think it, it, it is very memorable to the sales calls in the early 2000s oh, we're going to assess to find a Wi-Fi hotspot, the response being, oh, there are no Wi-Fi hotspots in this building. We have a policy against it, oh, except for the one under the CEO's desk. Right. And right. so, and, and so right. it's, it, it is deja vu. Right. Uh, and I, this is a question um, for, uh, I'd, I'd say probably for Chris. Um, how do the... Uh, sort of threat scenarios uh, in the IoT space differ from traditional enterprise um, IT. Um, presumably we're going to see s same actors but different different MOs. Um, uh, what what do you see as, because we're, we're not going to have the mono, we're not going to have like a Windows monoculture, right? This is going to be a more diverse. Yes, yes, so when Microsoft was the whipping boy of the 90s and they did a great job turning that company, company around. The best hackers I know use use Windows because they know it's safe. Right. Um, Android is the, the new Microsoft, um, and most mal code is on Android. And Android and other uh, most embedded devices are running some Linux or Unix derivative. And so the challenge is going to be, you know, 
when, when you have 50 IoT devices, whether it's in your house or hundreds in your workplace, um, who's going to patch them? You know, when I ask a layperson, when's the last time you patched your router? My what? When the cable guy came eight years ago. Um, and so, so um, uh, you know, these are the types of problems we'll see. I don't know what the first attacks will look like. We'll probably see, see some exploratory stuff like a slammer or a code red, just someone showing off the sport. Right. But I think, I think conversely we'll see these attacks quickly monetized. You know, I got a little antsy yesterday when the White House lost power. I got a little antsy last week when Turkey lost power. Right. I don't know if we're able to get the whole story, but, you know, my first response when I see some, the White House, the State Department, and um, other key buildings in D.C. lose powers, wow, it's happening. Yeah, right. I, I thought the same thing, too. Like, oh, you know, is this a, is this a uh, industrial control system, a hack on a, on a particularly key substation? I mean, I, it doesn't seem to be that it was. It looks like it was a, a mechanical failure, but... But you, your mind goes there absolutely because we, we, you know, we've seen enough about about critical infrastructure. I think with, I think with Turkey just a week before, that just just really amplified it. Like, sure. wow, okay, it just felt like this was happening. It right. looks like they didn't, but right. We well, start to surprise if that's in our near future. Right, right. You start to think along those lines. You start to think along those lines. Um, Bill, you know, one of the one of the challenges, I guess, for for a company like Brevo um, in this space is and uh, is that the barrier to entry for new companies, right, to to cobble together existing technology and try and do a piece of what you guys do is is very low. You know, you're an established company, but that also means you've got a lot of, you know, legacy code and legacy products that you've got to support. How do you both um, leverage the, you know, cool, innovative, we can create new products quickly, um, but also differentiate yourself from your average uh, Kickstarter startup or... Um, small company that might come along and say, "Oh yeah, we can do door access, you know, with you know this Android app and this thing we built here, and um, you know, kind of piece it together, and some open source that we thrown together." Um, is that a concern for you guys that you know this is a very fast moving space and you need to be nimble? You want to ride the wave, but you don't want to get lost in it. Sure, no, it's absolutely a concern, and you know, the innovators' dilemma is sort of a traditional. Problem in any any industry where you you know had an established product, um, you know we try to think of ourselves as sort of the best funded startup out there, and that we're constantly trying to develop new products and use new tools based on um, really what our customers and our dealers are asking for, um, and you know we will not hesitate to you know embrace new technology at least in a Trial basis or you know pilot program, and we've we've got multiple pilots running right. uh, concurrently for new space. But you know the truth is, if I look at it from a, a an internet or just a general security standpoint, even if we lose a particular race to a smaller startup, if we can improve the state of the overall industry, that's okay. Okay. Um, you know, there's a huge amount of money that's going to be made in the IoT space. I think you know it's already somewhere around five hundred. You know, five hundred billion dollars. We're going to be looking at a trillion, trillion and a half dollars in market over the next five years. That that's a lot of sit. You know, that's a pretty big sandbox for us to play in. So, you know, we're we're happy to share. Right. Um. What? And I want to remind the audience: we are going to be taking questions uh, at the conclusion of our talk, probably in a couple minutes. Actually, there's a QA tab on the side of your window. There, if you click on that, you can pose questions for um, Chris, Charles, myself, uh, and we will absolutely respond to them. We're here talking uh, as part of IoT Live about Internet of Things and security. So, if you've got security questions, if you've got questions about uh, Rio, about Bastille, um, feel free to feel free to fire away. Um, so, Chris, you brought up a couple times this sort of patching and maintenance question, and I think it's a really good one. I think this is kind of where the rubber meets the road for Internet of Things and, and security, at least within the enterprise space, um, but probably within the home, too. 
Um, you know, we've seen a lot of stories in recent weeks, well, in the, really in the last year, about, for example, um, home routers, right, um, uh, IoT hubs. Veracode just did a, th a report on um, analyzing IoT hubs and some of the problems with those. Um, the types of things we're seeing is often, um, you know, poor, poor code quality, so exploitable vulnerabilities, and as you said, a real um, lack of uh, the ability to easily manage these devices. So, you know, you're looking at the home uh, broadband routers, and these things run the same firmware for years on end without being updated. The owners don't know enough to update them. The um, carriers who own, you know, who manage the devices don't really want to update them because that could create downtime um, and create support calls for them. Um, so I guess the question is, is the, is the question around manageability and how are we going to patch this population um, is it a technical problem, or is it kind of an um, an ownership and responsibility? Like we need to clarify whose responsibility it is to manage that device, and also set the bar for them to do that. So say you should all be like Microsoft. You should be doing over-the-air updates. You know, um, get permission from your users to apply them for them and make it invisible and streamlined. And that's how you're going to manage your population of devices. Or conversely say, no, it's the owner's responsibility and, and um, you just have to make them aware of it. Yeah, I, you know, I, it's going to be a tough problem. I think we're going to need to have a couple of <coughs> excuse me, serious disasters before we address this. I think if you're the Fitbit product manager, right. do you want your product out two weeks before Christmas or do you want to wait six months to make sure it's secure? Right. Right. You, you're, you're getting that product out. Right. <laughs> Pick out the security later. Um, right. and, 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 and that's what we're doing. Time to market is way more important these guys. And that's okay as long as we deal with it at some point. Um, I mean, we can't hold a wearable or a, a Kindle uh, to the same standards of security as a Dreamliner or the Space Shuttle. Um, and um, otherwise, we'd have no innovation. Um, I do like what FTC Chairwoman Ramirez is doing. She is spanking the guys that are seriously screwing up. Right. Um, and that kind of goes, and then the quick list of questions we had at the time, that kind of goes into what's government role. I certainly don't want to see a bunch of guys in Congress who don't have email writing a policy about this. Um, that's scary. Uh, but I do think it is the enforcement job uh, to when consumers are duped. Uh, to, to, to punish those companies. Right. I think that we need a legal 2.0 revolution so that people don't have to click yes on a 40-page UI. Right. So one of the things I'm just going to jump on too quickly is the privacy side is absurd. I mean, when you buy these products, you are the product. Yeah. I don't, uh, three, three or four examples I've seen so far, Jawbone quietly published a report on the recent San Francisco or California earthquakes. It was pretty cool. Scientifically, they were they were able to measure when people woke up the movement of the earthquake. But it made me realize when I read it was, wow, Jawbone owns when I wake up. It's theirs. Yeah. Uh, there's right. a there's a work, workers' comp case in Canada right now where his Fitbit data was subpoenaed because he was at the gym working out while he's collecting workman's comp. Now, this poor guy probably didn't know that his Fitbit data could be subpoenaed. Yeah. And the final kind of funny one, um, you're able to share uh, health data, right, with your friends. And um, a couple um, were sharing their data, and uh, it, this man's girlfriend was out of town, and she noticed an irregular high heart rate. It's a time of the evening, and um, it caused termination of the relationship. <laughs> um, probably he probably didn't realize that he would be sharing his heart rate with his partner at two in the morning, and so. But the companies all own that product. So my thesis with the millennials is, you're willing to sit there for ten minutes and read the instructions, read the ingredients on a bag of bread, but you won't. You don't care about your data, and um, and so I like the option. And I put a piece of the Guardian just said I'm proposing. I'd rather pay a dollar ninety nine a month to at least have my data completely deattributed. You know, I know they need the data for for their business model, and 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 and, and not to go too late. I mean, Keurig was a great example of a failure here, right? 
the money was to be made off the of K-Cups. They didn't plan for DRM to be broken on the K-Cups, and anybody can make their own K-Cup now. Right. And, and so it's a good similar metaphor to where we're going with the IoT. So, so the ability to opt in to pay for pay Samsung ninety nine a month, nine cent a month, so they don't record your phone your phone voice conversations. You're going to have to adjudicate the business model because clearly these business models were developed with selling that data. Sure, sure, absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, uh, I wanted to go to questions. Um, Alex, I see you popped in. What's up? Oh, you're good. Yeah, I was going to say, why don't you uh, take the questions to the audience, and then I'll I'll wrap it up there in about ten minutes. Is that if that works? That sounds great. That sounds great. Um, so the, the first question is from Dewan, and he's asking, um, how is the progress of IoT in um, property and casualty insurance, and are there examples of companies which are leveraging IoT? to a big level, and I'm guessing in a big level with regard to um, liability, risk and liability, I'm guessing. Um, Charles, your, your thoughts on that? Is this a conversation you guys are having? It, it is, and uh, there are absolutely uh, folks that are trying to leverage uh, IoT, and especially wearables in, in property and liability. Um, we're actually seeing it from two sides. So folks are beginning to use data in the way that Chris mentioned, where uh, with you know casualty or workman's comp insurance claims they're using data from personal devices as part of the evidence uh, in that case you know if your Fitbit shows you're at the gym but your you know your workman's comp uh, insurance may be denied on the other side we're starting to see folks um, in the casualty and life safety industry begin to use mobile and wearable technology to enhance the safety and security of those spaces uh, so, for example, geofencing with a mobile phone. Now you know exactly how many people are in your space. You've got built-in cameras, built-in microphones. You've got personal data uh, from the folks that are in that space. So if an, you know, an emergency situation should happen, the first responders have a wealth of data uh, to, to help them get the best response possible. So it is absolutely uh, being used right now. Okay. Um, the next question is from uh, either Henry or Henri, depending on where he is in the world. Um, is there a need for standards to enable IoT to grow? If so, which are the most critical missing standards? Um, so I guess do, are, is there a need for standards in, in an area where we don't have them right now? There seem to be a lot of different, uh, as we said, competing standards. Um, so, are there are there standards out there that you really need that you're not seeing, um, Chris or Charles? Whoever wants to take a swing at it. I, I, my initial reaction was, we're it's like going to an Indian buffet with 120 entrees. There are plenty of standards to choose from. We don't need any new ones. <laughs> okay, no more standards. No mas. No mas. Charles, lots. Yeah, yeah. No, pretty much the same thing. I think you know, we absolutely need. A, few, a smaller number of standards, what those are going to turn out to be is largely going to be determined by the industry. I don't think anybody's going to sit back and wait for a government agency to decide that, you know, this is the standard. Yeah. Uh, it, it's going to happen organically. Right. There has been some movement on Capitol Hill around Internet of Things, so I think more around privacy and, and, and security. Um, uh, Chris, any thoughts on the, 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 the actions that the Senate have taken, the, you know, mostly symbolic, but uh, setting up some, some working groups around IoT? Anything good going to come of that? It kind of, when the government gets involved in software industry, <laughs> it makes me nervous. Um, you know, until we get some millennials in office, I mean, how can someone who's never written an email uh, draft uh, IoT policy? Um, so I know the staffers do most of the work, but... Um, uh, you know, I just hope they're not too restrictive. Um, I do think, though, the uh, consumer privacy is one they, well, they can address, and I think they've got um, a, an organization in place, FTC, that's got teeth to help with that. But to go out and if they mandate that IoT devices must be must be secure, I mean, that's not going to happen. Okay. Next question is from Ryan. How should an IoT device developer best go about offering security upgrades for their devices? 
Do you recommend a forced push of updates or user opt-in for updates or a user pull model for updates? I'd say forced updates. Uh, users don't want to think about it. Okay, Charles, thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, I would give the you know I would at least nod towards the user opt-in model, but failing that forced push. I don't I think you guys your consumers door. to pull software updates. They're not going to think about this stuff. It's going to be up to the manufacturers to deploy the updated software when it's ready. Okay. Good question here from the audience. What are some misconceptions about security as it pertains to IoT? Is there is the team that should own? Okay, so that's one. Um, so what are some? Well, forget that. That's too broad. Um, this is a better one. Is the team that should own security for IoT for an enterprise up to the task today? Um, and I guess I would add to that, which team should own I, uh, security for IoT? So is this IT? Is it operations? Is it, you know, who, where does that responsibility lie and where should it lie? Um, Chris, do you want to take a swing at that? Yeah, so I have a long vision on this. Ten years ago, you remember, we actually had a phone guy, right? There was a phone guy. It was special for the phones. There is no phone guy today. Yeah. We don't even have a phone here. Um, there are PR people are making us buy one for interviews, but hey, that's it. A hundred years ago, you had an elevator guy, you know? Yeah, so, so, so the elevator guy's gone. The phone guy's gone. I think we will see a mashup of the, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plagiarize the elevator, elevator guy from you. The, um, I think physical and cyber security over the next 10 years will become a common function. Um, and... Um, uh, but you know we're we're dealing with this will be in the in the CI, in the CISO's office, um, and the first step is for them to find tools to scan and assess their environment. They honestly just don't exist today. We're building one, but you can't just go out and buy buy a security tool to to secure your IoT yet. They're just the, the market's not there yet. Yeah. Right, Charles. Thoughts? Yeah, we're actually spinning off uh, IT security and privacy from the IT operations team for exactly that reason. Um, it's, it's become too specialized and too divergent from general IT ops to, to be handled on the same team. Anymore. And, you know, from the privacy perspective, I spend as much time working with the legal team and the marketing team as I do with the IT guys. So it's, it's going to be its own niche, uh, and that's going to develop over the next couple of years as well. I don't think we've got a good picture on how broad that, uh, that job role is going to be just yet. Okay. I think we've got time for maybe one more question. Who will the provisioning leaders in IoT be in five years? Is this doomed for fragmentation? We're already fragmented. I think the, we're going to see consolidation over the next five years. I think Chris's analogy of, of netware and the, the early 90s networking is entirely apt here. Yeah. We've got dozens of small players that are all vying to be top dog, and we're going to see uh, a Vast shrinkage in that over the next over the next five years until we've got one or two key players that emerge. Okay. So I, I, that's a great response. I would actually answer. I agree completely, and I would actually answer it slightly differently. So this was the first year in my life I attended both CES and Mobile World Congress, and I intentionally spent a half day in the cheap seats with the the, the cheap Chinese knockoffs. And mm -hmm. I think in a couple of years you're going to be buying fake. Uh, Apple Watches and fake Fitbits on Times Square for five bucks, and you got to believe they're not going to have patches. They're probably going to have malcode on them already. So um, uh, I think there will be a serious um, issue of of um, counterfeit IoT. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, right. And supply, and you know that supply chain issue may well work its way into premium products as well. Right. I mean the the same. Organizations that are that are producing those knockoffs are producing the real devices, and, and that goes for the enterprise too. Okay, I think we're at the end of our time, Alex. Yeah, awesome. So first off, uh, Charles, thank you very much for joining. Um, Chris, we look forward to your, your announcements at RSA here in a few weeks. And then uh, for everyone who's watching, uh, Paul is really a thought leader when it comes to security. So if you get a chance, check out his website at securityledger.com. Um, you know, there's just wonderful content up there. And again, to all three of you, it's been a wonderful panel. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us here on IoT Live and look forward to having you all join us in the future. And if anybody out there has additional questions that we may not have addressed or that you come up with after the panel, feel free to contact me or anybody on the panel for that matter um, to get those questions answered. And again, uh, thank you to everybody for joining.